Hey, hey everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Michael Blanc. Really excited that you're here to learn all about apartment building investing, the number one best way to become financially free in one to three years. Whether you're an active investor or passive investor, it's so cool. You know, I had the pleasure of being at DealMaker Live a few uh, weeks ago. It's our annual conference. We had almost 500 people there. And one of the things we gave out was these uh, these awards, right? These are the Freedom Hall of Fame coins. And if you're watching some video, I'm holding up this cone right now. If you're not, I'm just going to describe it. The front of it says financial freedom. It's got an eagle on it. And the back, it says uh, it has a compass rose on it. And it says significance and legacy on the bottom. Today's guest has achieved this goal, financial freedom. And that's what we're after. Uh, but we're only after that, even though that's my public mission, the private mission is to help empower people to live a life of significance because it's very difficult to live a life of significance if you're working 50 plus hours right can i hear amen to that yeah it's tough right because your brain is full of work and and then maybe family putting your kids to bed and, and that's about it maybe some some errands that you get around on the weekend and it's very difficult to think about to develop the, the self-awareness of figure out hey what is my true north what is my legacy how do i live a life of purpose and this is why it lights me up when I can find people who have quit their jobs with apartment buildings because it fascinates me how they did it. Their journeys are always different and there are some of their challenges are somewhere different. How do they overcome those challenges? How do they go from having a regular W-2 job? Why do they take action? How do they do it? And what is their life like now? So today on the show, we have Mauricio Ramos. Super excited. He's a, an immigrant from Mexico, came here on a student visa, worked for 10 years in a construction business and realized that, man, I, I, I don't want to work like this for the rest of my life. I want to travel. I want to be free. I want to control my time. So he really talks about his journey and it's super, super interesting. So let's get right into the story here with Mauricio Ramos. Here we go. Mauricio, welcome to the show. Hey, Michael. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, man. Pleasure is all mine. I just, I love your story. So first of all, you're in your home office because you're no longer working. What's, what's it like to work for yourself? Oh, man, it's awesome. It's awesome. But it's now I'm working several more hours and there's no commute. So you start working earlier, you finish working later, but still I enjoy it every minute of it. Well, you were, you were in construction, a construction manager earlier on. We'll get back to that story real quick, but, but like, how is your life different now? than it was before. So you're working a little bit more, but like, what is, how's it different and which one do you like better? So I definitely work, uh, like working for myself better now. Um, so it's different and it took probably about, I'd say probably three to four months to really sink in, in my head to, uh, you know, sometimes I would have something to do. I would start at seven or 8 a.m. But then by 2 p.m., I didn't have anything else to do. I was done for the day. So it was like, I, I need to find something else to do. And because I was used to, you know, it's 2 p.m. It's not time to go. So you, you need to still work in, to keep, keep on working. So that, that took some time to sink in. And, and, you know, I was able to say, all right, I'm, I'm done for the day. And then I can, you know, go walk my dogs or just go do something else. It, it's okay to not be working at 2 p.m. <laughs> Well, that's good that you say that because a lot of us entrepreneurs struggle with that, right? We feel like we need to, uh, we need to fill every available time and the, you know, not doing anything smells a lot like being unproductive and it just doesn't rubs us the wrong way. And uh, so what did you decide, to, what did you fill your time with? Um, so I started, I started uh, implementing in my calendar that that's something that it really helped me. Grant Cardone says, if you want to meet the devil, uh, leave blank spaces on your, on your calendar. So I started just filling it in with, you know, go analyze the deal, go on LoopNet and find a deal, analyze the deal, uh, talk to brokers, just putting it in the, in the, in the calendar. And then that way, you know, it's time to do this. And then sometimes it would be a struggle, but make an effort to stop doing what you're doing, go to the next task. And, and that, help me get in the role of keep keep my day bc throughout the day did you what about any other activity so you're you're obviously still looking for a deal you're actively syndicating we'll get into that as well uh, did you how else are you spending your time so i spend time with my family as well um I, we have two pomeranians so you know i take him for walks during the day um 
enjoy I also enjoy reading and listening to podcasts. I usually go go work out around 11 a.m. now, whereas before I would go, you know, at five or six p.m. where it was packed. So now I go during the day, which is there's a lot more freedom, a lot more space in the gym. So I enjoy that too. That's cool. Did you do any traveling? What else? What else did you do? Um, I have done some traveling. I've been to 20 countries around the world um, the last few years. So I've enjoyed doing some traveling. Also being able now to go to some seminars that might take, you know, more than, more than a few days. Like I've been, I was in your uh, Dealmaker Live a few weeks ago and that was awesome. So that's, it's pretty good to, you know, not, not have to ask for the day off because you have to go travel, you have to go somewhere. Um, so that I enjoy that freedom as well. So you're still working hard and you're working hard uh, to get to where you are right now, but it, was it worth it? Because there's twists and turns, a lot of risks, a lot of sleepless nights, and I'm sure we'll get into some of that. But, you know, is that something that you would do again? And, and why would you do that again? Absolutely. I would do it again. Uh, I have to say that, you know, the 10 years that I was in, in corporate America definitely helped me uh, to to do what I do now on the syndication side and on the entrepreneur side, just learning how to, how to, how basically how does money work? How does, uh, the, the entire business works. So that definitely helped me, but I would definitely do it again. Um, it's a lot better to work on, to work for myself than, than to work for somebody else. Yeah. So talk a little bit about your backstory because, uh, you're not from around here. I, I am not. That's correct. I am from Amere, Yucatan in Mexico. Um, so I'm an immigrant to this country. Um, I, I was always legally present in this country. But so I grew up in uh, Matamoros, Tamaulipas, uh, also in Mexico. It's a border town, uh, South Texas. And I lived uh, there until I graduated high school. That's in Mexico. And then I came to Texas for college uh, under a student visa. And graduated as a civil engineer from Texas A&M University. I worked for 10 years in the construction industry as a project, project manager uh, under a work visa. So, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, and, and this, is, this is great, right? I'm sure your parents were proud that you, you know, finished college and got a great job. And what was wrong with that picture? Uh, nothing was wrong. Actually, while probably I was about six years into, into construction and I met some people that, you know, kind of like traveling and I did my first backpacking uh, trip to Europe. It was like 40 days. Actually, I had to quit my job and go um, because I couldn't get, you know, 40 days off. So I quit my job and I said, you know, this, that's it. I'm, I'm out of construction. Um, and actually went back to construction and went back to work for that same company. <laughs> they took you back. They took me back. Yes. I, yes. They couldn't get rid of me. Uh, so, but then during that trip, I realized that uh, there, there had to be some other way to continue traveling, to continue. I, I met so many people, right. So that, that didn't have jobs and, in in that kind of stuff so i i said there, there's another way there has to be some other way that you can continue to make money without having to be there all the time it took me about three years three more years after that to figure out how hmm. and found the answer finally it's real estate it's funny it's when i would rich that poor dad in 2005 it was like well this is passive income is really cool but it wasn't until i read Tim Ferriss for four hour work week when i was like no way <laughs> you can not only not work more than four hours, but you can do that anywhere in the world. Like that's the coolest thing. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. So you said, Hey, I know what I want. I want to be able to work whenever I want, wherever I want. And you're like, I don't exactly know how to do it, but what was your, what did you do after that? Like, what was your, what, did, what were you thinking? What was your plan? So, so actually I ventured into day trading for less than a year. And, you know, I realized that yes, it, it's something that you could do, kind of on the side while I was working. Um, but I still, it, it was still trading time for money, right? You still have to be there every morning to do it, to do the trades. And yes, there's some freedom to it, but not, not as good. And so I kind of stopped that for a little bit and continue working, moved to San Antonio. Uh, I'm in San Antonio, Texas now, 
moved to San Antonio and then, and then in the construction company that I was working at, one of my interns, he introduced me to single family real estate. And his, he was like, hey, do you, do you like uh, real estate? And it was completely foreign to me. Um, I, I was even renting an apartment. I didn't even own my house at the time. So, so he introduced me to it, went to a few areas, started learning, started reading about, get, uh, reached that poor dad um, in other books and started really changing my mindset about money and about investing. And then uh, during those areas, I found a mentor uh, that, that taught me, you know, how to get started. So I bought a mobile home. My first deal was a mobile home which I paid cash for, I fixed it up and owner financed it out, which they're still paying me for that every month. And then after that, I did another mobile home. Uh, and then I, I wholesale a few houses and that's d- during, during, I was driving for dollars a lot and I was listening to podcasts. And during one of those podcasts, I found multifamily. Somebody talked about multifamily and you know, explain how the numbers worked. And me being an engineer, everything just made sense. Every, every, I pretty much understood everything that, what the, that the person was saying. So at the time, fell in love with it and started, you know, reading more books about multifamily, uh, listening to podcasts, found your podcast, and uh, going to seminars about multifamily. And that's when I really, uh, I was still working at the time and I really went like full on, um, multifamily. I started doing my direct, my first direct mail campaign in September 2017. So by December that same year, a few months later, I got my first 10 unit apartment complex. This was in Pleasanton, Texas, which, which is south of San Antonio. And this was a seller finance deal, 7% down, 0% interest, 60 day moratorium. And that actually sold uh, not long ago, 18 months later for 159 uh, percent return on investment. That's a nice little deal. That's fantastic. So as you were, you were dabbling around with real estate and you kind of said, Hey, this is interesting. Like, I like the idea of it. What was, what was fundamentally, what didn't you like about the stuff you were doing to single family houses or mobile home parks? What is it maybe that you're like, ah, I wish I could do something different. So the scalability and also I knew that, you know, being being having my 10 year background in construction, I knew I didn't want to go into flipping houses, right? I, in my mind, it was like, I'm not going to quit a job about construction to go into another job just about the same thing, just in houses. So, um, so I knew I didn't want to do that. And I wanted to do rentals because I wanted that cash flow. But then, you know, as I, as I started digging more and more, I, I said, all right, dude, how long is it going to take me to, to get 10 houses? And and is, is that where I want to get? Is, is that going to take me where I want to be in 10 years? Uh, maybe not. And also one thing that I, that I kind of didn't really, I don't know, if maybe I didn't take the time to, to figure it out correctly. But with single families, you know that the comps and the ARVs. And I always had to reach out to somebody to help me with, hey, I found this property. Can you run the comps for me? Can you give me the ARV? And it was always that kind of like having to outsource part of it and just waiting, right? So with multifamily, found your, when I found multifamily, found your SDA and learn about it, learn how to use it. And you know, if I, I was able to receive a lead, analyze the deal and then submit an offer if, if, if it was a good deal without having to, you know, outsource that portion without in actually not understanding that ARV portion, right? I understood every process of it. So that's, that's one thing that I didn't like about single family. And I really, really loved about multifamily. That's interesting. And your SCA is uh, the syndicated deal analyzer, which is our analysis uh, spreadsheet. Uh, but yeah, that's the thing I didn't like about sing, uh, the single family house. So the, the, the ARE was, it was a little art in science and mostly art, right? You're like, ah, it's really hard with us on the, on the multifamily. It's, really easy like you just apply a formula to the NOI as long as your NOI is reasonable you're like oh I know what this is worth like it's really cool and what I also liked about it is I can actually change it like I can influence the value by increasing the NOI and I was like wow exactly. I can't do that with a house I can put a renter in there for two hundred dollars more a, a month but I'm not it's I'm still limited by my ARV I can't it doesn't really matter now what were some of the you know challenges you were going through at the time you're like I gotta do this and I you start learning about this multifamily thing. You're like, this is pretty cool. 
Uh, I can, I understand the numbers. I can scale a little better, but what were some of your, I don't know, your challenges or limiting beliefs or things you were struggling with um, that uh, was maybe holding you up and getting into that space? As I started getting in more and more into, into um, multifamily, you know, I started, all right, see if I want to buy a bigger deal then I need to, I need to put all this money together and that, which I don't have. And I need to start reaching out to other investors and, and, you know, learn enough so I can, so I can kind of speak the language and sell them the, the, the investment opportunity. So that, that's where I, that was kind of like the second step, start learning how to raise money, how to syndicate that first deal that I did, that 10 unit, that was all my own. Um, so, so that's kind of trying to go to the next step. Those were the challenges that, that I found. So you got around that by, it sounds like you had got some seller financing off that first deal. And so you're like, Ooh, that's how I solved the, you know, money. It sounds like you, you had saved some money up, but maybe not enough to do a 10 unit. You're like, Oh, I'll do some seller findings. And that was, that was pretty cool. Uh, and, and then what, what happened af after that? Did you do a second deal? Correct. So just like, just like you say, a uh, lot of the, uh, the first deal, right? So right after that deal, I got another uh, deal under contract. This was a, an eight unit in Kingsville, Texas. Um, so this I wholesaled for a five figure fee. Hmm. And right after that, a few months later, I got a 24 unit under contract in downtown San Antonio, prime location. So I was trying to, I tried to, um, I made a, an attempt to syndicate it at the same time I made an attempt to wholesale it. And when I put it on the market uh, on just in Facebook, within 24 hours, I had it under contract. So that made me a six figure fee, which was well over twice as much my uh, annual W2 income. <laughs> That's amazing. I had a similar experience when I flipped my first two houses. I made as much money as my entire salary in the entire year on two house flips. I was like, this is insane. But Absolutely. now interesting. So you're trying to syndicate though, but you're struggling a little bit here. So what I like about you though, is that you became resourceful. You're like, oh, I'm going to sell finance the first one. I, I can't quite raise the money. Uh, and so I'll wholesale, which by the way, is not easy to do. I think wholesaling a daggone apartment building. Uh, what were you struggling with on the money raising side? So you were doing a good job. Uh, of finding deals and leads. And it sounds like because of the law of the first deal, you were starting to get leads coming to you. So you were, you didn't have any problem on the, on the deals uh, finding stuff. Why were you struggling on the money raising side? I, it, just education, education. I get started learning about how to source the deals and, and, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of, you know, I'll, I'll take the first step and then when I get there, I'll figure out the next step. <laughs> So, True entrepreneur, I love it. Uh -huh. So I figure out how to get deals and I got deals and then it's like, all right, what do I do now? So uh, wholesaled a few in uh, that, that those fees allowed me to put some money into the 10 unit, allowed me to uh, buy a, a mentorship program. I also got into a few Airbnbs around San Antonio and also became a passive investor in 152 unit. That's awesome. So you're wholesaling, you, you did one. Uh, you wholesale the couple. What what was next? Pass investment. Correct. So, uh, also at this point, when I get this this six figure fee, um, this is I was a I wasn't really uh, my my wife my girlfriend at the time, Dominga. Um, she's a mariachi teacher uh, here in San Antonio ISD. So we were engaged already, and so at that point, you know, financing became not a problem anymore, not an issue anymore. So we decided to, to just get married um, and quit my job and then just go full time into real estate. Mm. So right after this in 2019, uh, we've syndicated a 16 unit apartment complex. We closed in January. We syndicated a 32 unit apartment complex, which closed in July. Both of these are in McAllen. And now we have a 28 unit apartment complex under contract in here in San Antonio, Texas. Yeah. He told me that, that actually you got an LOI accepted while you're a deal maker live a few weeks ago. That's pretty cool. That's correct. Yes. That was awesome. All right. So how did you bridge, bridge that gap then? So you went from uh, doing a couple of wholesales, you couldn't quite raise the money and you did a pass investment and then you did your first, you did your first syndication, 16 unit. How did you go about raising that money? How, how did you bridge that gap from not being able to do it and wholesaling it? So then raising money for that deal. So sharing with, with 
coworkers at the time and then uh, some just friends and family about what I was doing with my 10 units, showing pictures, hmm. um, just sharing what I was doing with, with the properties that I had up to until then, even the, the two still until now performing notes on the mobile homes that definitely, um, I got some curiosity and interest from, from friends and family and say, Hey, you know, on the next deal, let me know. I want to invest with you. So, um, when I got that 16 unit put together the, um, actually just, just like you say it law, law of the first deal, I put together my, my sample package with the 24 unit. Yeah, it's good. And within a week of when I finished that package, the 16 unit apartment complex came under contract. And so I just kind of redid it with a 16 unit apartment complex and say, all right, let's try to hold, let's try to syndicate this. And sure enough, we were able to syndicate it and, and raise enough money for that. So it's not like you started raising money for that uh, 16 unit when you put it on contract. You were already talking about it before. Yes, that's correct. So what, do you, what is your advice to someone who's trying to raise money? Like, what would you advise that they do? When do they do it? How do they do it? Uh, definitely educate themselves, uh, learn about you know, complying with the SEC, but also talk to people, share, share what they do. Very, something very important as a money raiser to, to have correct in your mind, I think, is you're not asking for money. You're providing them with an opportunity to make awesome returns on, on their money, which likely they're not going to do anywhere else. So you are an opportunity provider versus you're asking for money. You're not asking for money. I think that's, that's a big thing that you have to change in your mind. Yeah, that's true. People are like, I, I don't, I don't want to beg my friends and family for money. Like, yeah, you're right. You're, you're, you're actually not begging. You're actually providing value, right? That's because absolutely. their problem is they're not getting a consistent return. No one can forecast the stock market. People are like pulling their hair out and they're paying too many taxes. Absolutely. So, I mean, can you get excited about what you're offering to people? Yeah, for sure. And that, that also has to do with, with how you, once you, you change that in your mind and you're saying, Hey, I am providing you with this great opportunity. Look at it. These are the numbers. And, and even, even an extra step is like, Hey, this, here's this great opportunity. Do you know anybody that it might be interested in this? You know, without saying, are you interested? Right without reaching out. It's just, do you know anybody that might be interested? And then at that point, um, they likely they'll say, well, yeah, I'm interested. Right. Okay. All right. So number one, it sounds like you're, you're not necessarily directly raising money. You're in sharing your enthusiasm with people about what they're doing. Hey, look what I'm doing. Look what I'm doing. If you're interested, you're giving them the sample deal package and you are continuing the conversation. Right. So that's, that's kind of what you're doing and you're asking for referrals. That's correct. That's now, absolutely correct. at one point you're going to exhaust your existing network and a referral network. Uh, what's next for you around the money raising? What, what do you, what do you think? How, how are you going to be able to scale this up? So going to conferences like yours, uh, you'll, you'll make your life getting to know other investors, getting to know other sponsors in town, um, you know, expanding with, with, uh, I'm, I'm partners also with, um, a, a chemical engineer that works in Valero here in San Antonio and, you know, he's been in corporate America for over 20 years. So um, you can imagine what kind of network he has, uh, the potential investors. So it's just partnering up with the right people in, in networking, continue to network. That's, that's awesome. Uh, what were some of the issues you had uh, during these, especially the last two deals? Um, any kind of hiccups you had while you were trying to raise money or close for it? So on the, on the 32 unit, um, that was my first deal using um, agency debt. So I used Fannie. So all, the, all that comes with it was definitely a surprise to me. Um, I, you know, there's a ton of paperwork. There's a ton of parties and all, all the communication, you know, they have, a, they have a legal counsel. We have a legal counsel. And then the, the SEC portion of it is just, it's just overwhelming. It can get overwhelming and, you know, comply with everything. But, um, so that was definitely a, um, heavy task, but, um, we were definitely able to overcome it and were able to close on it, but that was definitely a, um, 
challenge. Cool. Any other challenges? Um, can't think of anything. Everything went super smooth. That means, Mauricio, the deals aren't, deals aren't big enough. <laughs> 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 that's, that's awesome. So what's kind of, what's kind of next for you? Um, what's on the horizon? What do, you, what do you see over the next couple of years? Where do you want to take your, your business? So um, the, the, our goal for 2019 is uh, 250 units. So this 28 unit should put us over that. And the goal for next year is 600 units total. So uh, we need to continue um, to reach out to investors, uh, deal sores, um, reach out to brokers so, so we can find the next few deals and get them under our belt and continue growing. What do you say to people that are saying, hey, I can't, it's too tough to find a deal. The market's too hot. Yet magically, people like you are still doing deals. So how is it possible that you're still finding deals? So we do a lot of, a lot of it off market. This 28 unit was on, was, came from a broker, but, but it wasn't on the market. So, so those two things, um, try off market deals, either through postcards, direct mail, cold calling, however you want to do it, door knock. You know, many times you drive by a 16 unit apartment complex, it has a for rent sign on it. And, and the, the number on the sign is the, is the owners. Just give them a call and say, hey, I want to buy your apartment complex. Would you be interested in selling? So it, it's, it's just, it's not lack of deals, it's lack of creativity. Just, just reach out. And then same with, broker. So I feel like the broker that brought to me the 28 unit is the broker that sold my 10. So well, the first deal. Yeah. Right. So yeah. he sold my 10 and then immediately right after, um, he, he sent me the email with, with, with the numbers, sent him an offer. We agreed on a, a price and got under contract right away. So, you know, he would have not sent me that 28 unit. He had not s sold that 10 unit, but if, if I had not bought the 10 unit, you know, the way I bought it, seller financed and, and it just the way I bought it, right? Just, so ultimately, I think the, the, to answer your question, the advice is just take action, take action. Don't worry about how you're going to 1031 your unit out, your, your complex. Find, figure out how you're going to find a deal either through off market, on market, but just, uh, figure out the first step. And then once you're there, you figure out the next one and the next one. That's how you do it. So you don't have this stuff planned out in, in advance. I mean, I, I, I like to be prepared. Yeah. Yes. But not, not necessarily. You don't, I don't think you need to have, you need to wait until all the green lights are all, all the lights are green. Just, just as soon as the first one is green, just move forward and then you wait for the next one and keep going. It's a little unusual for an engineer to not have everything planned out, right? So you're probably wired a little bit like me. I, I'm very structured, very analytical. How is it that you're able to proceed without a clear plan? With, with uh, God's uh, blessing. That's how I do it. But, you know, um, you, have to, you, you have to know enough, right, to, that you're not, you're not walking on, on um, you know, legal mud right that you you can get in trouble on the s with the sec or 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 um somehow um, with any legal issues right you just have to know enough to not do that but um you don't have to know every single step all the way through step number 10 right as long as you know step one two three you're okay to to take action and then also it's about resource resource resourcefulness right so if you don't know something, you know somebody that, that does. So just pick up the phone, ask him, and you'll get there. So it takes the next three steps. And if you're stuck, you know that you'll figure it out somehow. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. So what's next? Are you going to get your, get your wife out of a job? Like what's kind of what's like the next milestone for you guys? It's, it's definitely in the conversations. Uh, so she, since, you know, she's a, she's a teacher it's, it's, you know, kind of like a year thing. So she started this year already. Uh, so potentially, potentially this will be the last year. Also, um, we're going to start working on growing the family. Uh, we don't have any kids yet, but looking, looking into it. So potentially when that comes, we'll, you know, 
she'll come out of her job and we'll just into real estate hundred percent, both of us. So you're at the point now where you're financial free to a certain degree. Uh, you're certainly working on your own terms. You could probably take a week off if you wanted to, or even longer. Yes. Uh, you feel like you obviously need to press forward. Um, what is, what is giving you that sense of urgency? One of my goals, I guess, uh, I guess the answer to one of my goals is to stop working. I'm 34 right now. Um, I want to stop syndicating uh, when I'm 40, at 40. Then after 40, I might just be a passive investor on other people's deals. But I want to uh, stop syndicating and, or quote unquote stop working. I, I feel like I will become a deal junkie and I will keep on doing them right. But uh, so that is my, my uh, sense of urgency. I need to, you know, I have six years. I, I have to get it done. So I don't have any time to spare between now and 40. And then after that, that's it. And then what? And then travel. And then go buy uh, uh, some real estate outside the United States and, and continue um, cash flowing money. <laughs> you don't strike me the kind of person that can sit on the beach for the rest of your life. So you'll, f you'll figure something out. Yep. That's awesome. Congratulations, man. This is a great, you know, just coming from where you came from and the experience you've been through. You're still a pretty young guy. You figured out really quick. Uh, you just kept doing it and you were resourceful. So it's a great model for, for all of us. Mauricio, how can people connect with you? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I'm on Instagram as uh, Mao RMS. So M A U R M S. Uh, my webpage is the Medici group. That's uh, D E M E D I C I group.com. The Medici, like the Italian last name. And um, we hold a meetup every third Wednesday of the month in San Antonio called Multifamily Invest Differently. So if anybody's interested, just go into meetup.com and look up uh, Multifamily Invest Differently. You'll find it there. And um, also my email, it's Mauricio, M-A-U-R-I-C-I-O at demericigroup.com. And if anyone is interested in started in multi in getting started multifamily, feel free to reach out. I'll be happy to you know answer any questions or uh, or you know another set of eyes on on a deal that you're underwriting. I'll be happy to do it for free. Just don't expect me to do the entire underwriting <laughs> for free. Nice. Uh, but, yeah. And we'll put some of the, we'll put all your information in the show notes. It's going to be at the michaelblank.com forward slash session one seven nine. Mauricio, thanks so much for being here on the show today. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. One of the common threads I'm noticing in people who have quit their jobs is they tend to take action without overanalyzing things. And Mauricio is an example of that. And I love what he says about just do the next three things. And I don't even prime it for that because I talk about that all the time. Is like, hey, what should I do? There's so many steps necessary to do my first deal and the second deal and the third deal. And I'm like, dude, just, just do the next three things. And it's very disconcerting to many people to not know what comes after. This is also, for example, why a lot of people, they don't actually make submit offers. It's a darnest thing. They'll keep busy, but they're not actually submitting offers because they're afraid of what happens if their offer is accepted. It's really bizarre, but it happens a lot. And it's because people don't know what happens after that. They don't, they, it's an unknown. And you get, to, as an entrepreneur, you have to get comfortable with this discomfort zone, right? So the growth always happens right outside your comfort zone. And we call this the growth zone. It's right outside your comfort zone. You got to learn how to operate in that. Now, you don't want to be beyond the, the, the growth zone, which I call the panic zone. Okay, that's bad. Don't, don't be in that. But you got to be in that growth zone. And you have to be, have to be comfortable in working there, which means that you're not always going to know everything. The time is never going to be right. You just have to move forward. That's something that, that he uh, really emphasized. The other thing also is you're resourceful. Right? You, just gotta, you have to trust that you can problem solve. Entrepreneurs are the best problem solvers ever. There's no way you can know everything up front. It's like, hey, I want to be super ready for fatherhood. Like, I'm never ready for fatherhood. I remember taking all these classes, reading his books. You know, baby's coming in two days. I'm like, I'm like freaking out because there's so many different things that can happen. You can never be ready for fatherhood. You can certainly try. You're never really going to succeed. And it's the same thing for doing anything meaningful, uh, like quitting your job with, with real estate, right? You're never going to be ready. Yes, educate yourself, read the books, listen to podcasts, but you just got to do it. And you got to trust that 
you're going to figure out that you're going to be able to problem solve as things go go on. So he was very flexible with his deals. He was able to get the deals under contract, but then he was hasn't really been raising money. So he got resourceful. He goes, I'm just going to flip the contract and he wholesaled it. Very clever. I think that's really hard to do on an apartment building. But hey, kudos for being resourceful. The other thing I find really super interesting is people who are financially free are in this temporary zone of confusion. I don't know if you sensed that. When I asked him what a sense of urgency was, he squirmed and was silent. And he asked if I would edit out the silence. I was like, no, I rather enjoyed the silence and the squirming. And I find it fascinating with people who are reached where Mauricio is. They're in, a, they're in a sense of confusion. They don't really know exactly what to do with themselves yet. And that's what I love about it. So your brain was all consumed by working. Your identity is so wrapped up in what you were doing. And now all of a sudden, you actually have room for being. Like that's a whole new feeling. It's a very unsettling feeling. And it's a necessary feeling though to kind of get the next level of self-awareness. And again, what I love about Mauricio is all I know is that I'm going to bust my butt for the next six years until I'm 40. And then my runway ends. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do yet. And it was it made him uncomfortable. But his challenge now, and I told him after the call is, holding up this uh, freedom this hall freedom hall of fame cone coin is that it's this true north on the back end right so once you're financially free your goal now changes the stakes become higher your goal now is to search for your true north for that significance and legacy and and, uh, and he says yep that's what i'm working on right now so that's what i really love about being financially free it it, it opens up your mind it shakes your foundations and it makes you become more self-aware about, hey, what is the true meaning? Why am I really here? And that's what's really exciting about that. So I'm just really excited about this business that we're in. And you know, our mission, our goal is to help a thousand people kind of financially free, people that we have substantially influenced along those those ways. We have so many resources for you guys with this podcast, but if you're listening to this podcast, we all have the same exact thing on YouTube. If you're on YouTube, hey, you can download this thing and listen to it in a car. Right, we all have these free resources, these blogs, but we also have paid programs. You know, our flagship online course is the ultimate guide to buying apartment buildings with private money. Uh, in fact, we have a free webinar. It's the uh, how to do your first apartment building deal without experience or cash. I don't really talk about it too much. People kind of just find it, and we refer them every once in a while. But it's uh, themichaelblank.com forward slash blueprint. It's really the blueprint of financial freedom by showing you how to do your first deal. And it's all in that. It's a free webinar, training webinar. It's the michaelblank.com forward slash blueprint. And it shows you how to do your first apartment building uh, deal, even if you don't have any experience or, or previous cash. And so really excited about that. If you're ready for something more, we have an awesome mentoring program. So excited. Uh, we have our students doing much bigger deals much sooner. And they're really accelerating in that timeline. And they're joint venturing with each other. They're raising money. Super excited. If you want a conversation with us, check us out at themichaelblank.com forward slash mentor. And you can set up a free strategy session call. We'd love to talk with you and see if it's right for you. All right, guys. Hope you guys were inspired by Mauricio's story. I certainly was. And he said, you know, his mission really is to show other people, inspire other people. Because if an immigrant from Mexico can do it, no one has an excuse why they can't do it either. So hope you were inspired by that and you take action. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Catch you in the next episode. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. Now, as the next step, download this ebook right here, okay? When you've downloaded that, uh, make sure you also subscribe to my YouTube channel because then you can get all of the videos that I release as soon as I release. So make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel right now. Click on that right now. And then also make sure that this is the next best video to watch is this one right here. So hope you enjoyed that. I'll catch you next time.